Genesis 43. Okay, let's do a recap in the story of Joseph, since we haven't done one ever, besides every lesson. Um, who wants to go first? Tell me, let's just start it. Start it with Joseph in 37. Let's walk it through. Y'all want me to do it? Or y'all want to do it? All right, I'll do it. I can tell y'all are not a real talkative bunch here. All right, 37. Jacob takes a wife that he loves. Who was the wife that Jacob loved? Her name was Rachel. Who was the ugly one? Now, I can say that because it says Rachel was pleasant to the eye and Leah wasn't, okay? Jacob had how many kids total? His name gets changed to Israel. We know them as the blank tribes of Israel. Twelve. So Jacob, Israel, has twelve kids. Bonus points if you get this question right. How many women did he have those twelve kids by? Four. Who were they? Rachel, Leah, and both of their handmaids. Really good. Okay. So Joseph is the son that's loved. Now remember, Benjamin's not born yet. Joseph is the son that's loved. And Joseph was given what by his father? You drew it all the time as a kid. A coat of many colors. And then I ruined some of your childhoods and said, I don't know what color the coat was, if it really had many colors. Some commentators think it's translucent. Irrelevant, not the point. The point was... Joseph was given the coat. Some think it was a lot of purple to do with royalty. Joseph was given the coat to show that he had the authority to rule over his brothers. Now, remember, Joseph went out to his brothers, and he was to come back and give what on them? He kind of had to go give a report. But when he gets out there, his brothers, they were upset at him, right? Why were they upset at him? Because Joseph was the dreamer. And before this event, Joseph had had how many dreams? Two dreams. Now, why is two important in the Bible? Yeah, good. The testimony of two witnesses, God gives a surety of his word. And both the dreams pointed to the same thing. In Genesis 37, it said, Joseph told his brothers the dream and his dad, and it said that his brothers, his mom and dad, would bow down to him, uh, essentially. And we're getting to that today in our chapter in 43. But Joseph's brothers, they kill him, more or less, by throwing him in the pit, and then... They're like, nah, let's change our mind. We're going to sell him to these Ishmaelite slave traders, okay? So essentially, Joseph is dead, and he's pictured as resurrected up out of this pit, and then he gets sold as a slave, and he goes down to Egypt. Now, whose house did he go to in Egypt? Potiphar's house. Was he respected in Potiphar's house, or was he low-level dog? Respected. He was elevated, put in charge, but Potiphar, I, she was bad, okay? She was bad. What happened? What happened? What specifically did she rip off of Joseph whenever he fled? She ripped his, coat, his cloak off of him, whatever he was wearing. What did that symbolize? Joseph now was losing his power, going back down into the pit. He went to prison. But there were two people who were in the prison that Pharaoh put in there. Who were they? The cupbearer and the baker. And we said that cupbearers brought what to the king? Wine and bakers baked what for the king? Bread communion and remember the third day the judgment was passed and they were both elevated out of there now one of them was good and one of them was what bad this is the same type of picture of christ on the cross remember joseph in the life of christ or christ in the life of joseph you had two thieves one of them was restored to paradise and one of them was judged for unbelief same concept joseph has to interpret pharaoh's dream and now he winds up sitting where at the right hand and everyone has to come to him to eat bread and wine and have grain. Everybody get it? Sound like a familiar story? Jesus, the one who comes out among his brothers, he came to his own and his own didn't receive him. He winds up being more or less a slave and they kill him, but he ascends to the right hand and he says he's the true bread and the true living water and you must come to him and eat and drink. You see the picture of Joseph? All right. Now, since we've covered our basis, we can go to Genesis chapter 43. Remember the last chapter that... Joseph's brothers wind up coming down to Egypt and they spill the beans essentially and say Jacob's still alive and there were total of us 12 brothers now that would have been news to Joseph because Joseph wouldn't have known who existed yeah he didn't know Benjamin was born I think the way I understand it Joseph would have already been sold into slavery and didn't know Benjamin existed so he'd been like okay but did they bring Benjamin to Egypt no why why would Jacob not let Benjamin go to Egypt I think he said it in 42.4. He said, 
well, let some calamity happen to him. You know, I'm not sending him down there. Jacob wasn't a dummy. He knew something real weird happened with Joseph. Something wasn't right with how Joseph died or disappeared or whatever it was. So Joseph said, all of you can go home, but one of you is going to stay. Which one stayed? Who was kept behind? Simeon. All right. Was Simeon the oldest son, yes or no? Remember, it went Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. Say it with me. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. That's really important because Joseph would have thought for all of those years, he would have thought, man, Reuben, you're the oldest son. You sold me out like a punk. But remember last chapter in 42, Reuben told the story and said, I told y'all not to mistreat the boy. And Joseph heard it and wept. So he went to the next in line and held him accountable and kept Simeon behind. So Simeon is now in prison in Egypt, all the rest of the brothers at home, but God's about to speed the story up. He's fixing to force a famine even worse. How many years of plenty were there? And how many years of famine would there be? Is that good? And that's the dream that Pharaoh had. That's how Joseph got to be second in command. All right, 43.1. <coughs> now the famine was severe in the land. And it came to pass, when they had eaten up the grain, which they had brought from Egypt, that their father said to them, go back and buy us a little food. Well, what's the problem? Like, dude, we can't go back and buy food because the guy down there, remember, they don't know it's Joseph. The guy down there said, if you don't bring Benjamin, don't even bother coming back. Verse 3. And this is really important to this because I grew up my whole life, and maybe y'all did this too. When you went to church, the majority of time, which side of the book did you hear taught? The Old Testament or the New Testament? The New. New, 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 new. And we always, we just skipped the whole background. And I always wondered, like, okay, Jesus comes from Judah. Judah's not the oldest son. Like, what's, what's the background? And Judah plays a really, really, really prominent role in the life of Joseph. So one day when you're reading, just go back through and look at everything Judah did in the story of Joseph. And when you get to Genesis 49, 8 to 10, you'll understand why Jacob said to him what he did. Let's look at verse 3. Judah, the spokesman here, spoke to him saying, The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you send our brother with us, we will go down to buy food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. Israel said, Why would you deal so wrongfully with me as to tell the man whether you still had another brother? Why couldn't you all keep your mouth shut? Why are you telling him all the family secrets? But they said, The man, Joseph, asked us pointedly about ourselves and our family, saying, Is your father still alive? Have you another brother? And we told him according to these words, could we possibly have known that he would say, bring your brother down? Verse 8. Now watch this. Actually, before we read this, let's don't watch this. Go back up to uh, verse 37 in Genesis 42. Watch this. This is so good. You've got to get this in the story. This is really good. We talked about this last week, and I hated on Reuben pretty good for it. Now remember, Reuben's the oldest son. He should be the one that's responsible, that's held responsible for what happened and he essentially, again, should be responsible for Benjamin and uh, Simeon, who's down there. But watch what 37 says. Reuben spoke to his father, saying, Kill my two sons if I do not bring Benjamin back to you. Put him in my hands, and I will bring him back to you. Now, kill your grandsons, th that's not proper restitution. That's not eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Who should Reuben have said you can kill if I don't bring Benjamin back? himself this is the principle of kingship if you want kingship in the bible then you have to be willing to die for somebody now go to genesis chapter 49 right quick hold your spot in 43 but go to 49 if you want kingship in the bible you have to be willing to die for somebody or for the covenant cause at least 49 8 to 10 Jacob is on his deathbed. He's given his sons their blessing. And we've read this verse so many times in this church. You ought to have it memorized by now. It says, Judah, 
You are he whom your brothers shall what? Praise. They're going to come and worship at your gates. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone down. He bows down. He lies down as a lion. As a lion, who shall rouse him? Here we go. Here's our verse. The scepter, or the right to rule, to say it another way, all of the kings are going to come from Judah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until who comes? And who's Shiloh? Jesus. Good. So all of the kings from the people of Israel are going to come from the tribe of Judah until who gets there? Jesus. Good? Make sense to everybody? Why? Why? Genesis 43, verse 8. Then Judah said to Israel, and notice how it keeps switching Jacob's name back and forth. We've got a covenantal context here. Judah said to Israel, his father, Send the lad with me. We will arise and go, and we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I myself will be surety for him. See the difference in the way that Reuben thought and the way that Judah thought? This was the appropriate response. This was the proper attribution of kingship. You need to underline Genesis 43, 8, and 9 in your Bible because Genesis 43, 8, and 9 help to tell the story about why Judah has the right to be the king because he's willing to die for the covenant promise. He understood it correctly. If we start thinking about that in the life of Christ, then one thing stands out important in the life of Christ, that he is the king who is willing to die for his people. Now, let's ask a question. Actually, let's go somewhere. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 6. What's my favorite book in the whole Bible? It is Hebrews. Yes, it is. Very well. Hebrews chapter 6. I, I, wanna, I want you to see a very important point here. Not only was Christ our high priest, the one who goes to the Father on our behalf, but Christ is also pictured as the king. Now, based on what I just told you, the king has to be willing to do what for his people? He's got to be willing to die for the people. He did that. I want you to note this. How many of you have heard Melchizedek? You've Melchizedek all your life. You've heard that, right? Here's the importance of Melchizedek. I'm, I'm seriously, how many, raise them again. How many of you have Melchizedek? We've read that. We met Melchizedek back in Genesis 14. Um, Abraham defeated Shedeleomer. He meets Melchizedek um, and when the sun's coming up, and Melchizedek had bread and wine with him. They had communion. And remember that Abraham gave him a tenth of all the spoils. Abraham tied, more or less is what this is going to be said, to Melchizedek. And you, you read that and you think, well, who cares? Well, what does that matter? Well, is that, why is that so important? Who is this Melchizedek guy? Anyway, why, why is he a big deal? And here's a good principle for the Bible. The New Testament interprets for us the Old Testament. There are so many things in the New Testament that you and I probably wouldn't put together if it weren't for the divine inspiration of God telling it through the apostles or the writers of the New Testament. And for that, we need to say thank you. So we get really an explanation about why the kingship of Christ is so important because it has to do with his death. All right, look at Gen uh, Hebrews six seventeen. We ready? And I'm not sure this is what I want. Oh, yeah, it is. Okay, here we go. Thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise, the immutability, the unchangingness of his counsel, he confirmed it by an oath. This is referencing his Genesis 15 and the promise God made to Abraham that he would have a Messiah to come. That by two immutable things, remember Sunday I went to this passage, and these two immutable things were the burning pot and the smoking torch or oven, whatever it was, that passed through the sacrifice, which is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope, now watch this, we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil. That's where Jesus had gone in the spiritual tabernacle. Verse 20, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of who? All right, let's ask a question. In the Old Covenant, all of the priests came from which tribe? Levi. Good? Understand that? Jesus wasn't from Levi, though. He's a priest, but he's not from Levi. 
Therefore, is Jesus, since he's not from Levi, is he an old covenant type of priest according to the order of Aaron? No, he's a different type of priest. But here's what was unique about Melchizedek. Melchizedek wasn't just a priest. You know what else Melchizedek was? King. Priest king. That's Jesus Christ. Yeah, exactly. He said Salem. How did, where did where, where David know to build the temple at? He built it in Jerusalem, the city of peace. Okay? Melchizedek's really important as far as that goes. Watch this. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of Most High God, and that's a Gentile reference, some think, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, Genesis 14, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a what? Tenth part. Now, let me ask a question, church. Let's, this is a good question. You've got to get this one. From Abraham comes Isaac. Isaac to Jacob, and Jacob has a son named Levi, from whom all the priests come from. Good so far? Simple. So essentially, since Levi was in the loins of Abraham, when Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, Abraham was saying, Melchizedek is greater than me. Or to say it another way, the spiritual priesthood is greater than the physical priesthood. Or to say it another way, the priesthood of Jesus in the new covenant is greater than all of the old covenant priesthood order altogether. Good? That's the picture. Watch. It gets better. Verse 2, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest how long? All right, if you were a priest in the Old Covenant, say you came from Levi, say you're uh, Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, who's a priest. At some point, what do you have to do if you're Zacharias? You have to die, which means you have to stop giving, being able to intercede. When a priest would walk in to the temple to do his work under the Old Covenant, before he ever went in, you know what he had to do? He had to cleanse himself. That's exactly right, Bubba. You know what Jesus never had to do? Cleanse himself. You know what Jesus also never did? Died. Well, he raised from the dead, and he is a priest how long? Forever, according to the order of Levi, according to the order of Melchizedek, a spiritual priesthood. But remember, he's not just priest. Melchizedek is king of Salem. Verse 4. Now consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi, who received the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them, received Melchizedek, received tithes from Abraham, and blesses him who had the promises. What is the writer of Hebrews saying? He's saying that the priesthood of Melchizedek is greater than the old covenant priesthood in the order of Aaron. Does everybody see that? Good? All across the room. We good? All right. Verse 7. Now beyond all contradiction... The lesser is blessed by the better. Here mortal men receive tithes, old covenant. But their spiritual temple in heaven, he receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak. That's exactly what I just said. For he was still in the loins of his father Melchiz when Melchizedek met him. So when Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, that's essentially the same thing as saying Abraham was lesser than Melchizedek. Verse 11, and I'm almost, I'm almost done. I'll quit, I promise. I'll go back to Genesis. I just like this part. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek? If the old covenant was good enough, why did we need Jesus to be a spiritual priesthood of Melchizedek? and not called according to the order of Aaron. For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there's also a change of the law. Why don't we do things like they did in the Old Covenant? Different priesthood. This is better. Can I tell you all too? We don't want that. We don't want to go back to that. You got Christ. You got a better priesthood. It's better. And he's king. Verse uh, 13. For he of whom these things are spoken, Jesus, belongs to another tribe, Judah. 
from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident if, in the likeness of Melchizedek, spiritual priesthood, there arises another priest who has come, not according to the law of fleshly commandment, old covenant, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest, how long? Forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. You say, Zach, why'd you go on that tangent for? Because I want you to see something. Under the old covenant, the office of priest and king wasn't good. Do you remember Isaiah 6? Remember when Isaiah 6, verse 1, he said, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Remember that? You know why God killed Uzziah? Because Uzziah the king wanted to also be the priest. He goes in there to perform the work of the priest, and God kills him. In the old covenant, God separated the office of priest and king. But when Jesus the Messiah came, he put back together the office of prophet, priest, and king. Got it? Beautiful story. That's good. Really good. Now watch this. Go to Psalm 110, and I'll stop. In Harrisburg, we call this chasing all the rabbits. Psalm 110. Now look at verse 4. Psalm 110 speaks of not just the priesthood of Christ, but his kingship. Psalm 110.4 is what Hebrews 6 quoted, or 7 quoted. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. But wait, watch this, it gets better. Speaking of the same person, look at verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, the Father said to the Son, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. You know what that testifies that Jesus also is? king now when they killed jesus did they write over the top of his head jesus of nazareth priest of the jews what they write they wrote jesus of nazareth king of the jews because the king has to die for the people in order to be king that's a biblical principle judah does exactly that that's why he gets that blessing part partially all right go to genesis 43 and thanks for chasing that rabbit everyone that was free you are not paying me for that Forty-three eight. This time has got me messed up too. I'm, I'm used to looking at that clock ending on a six, and now I'm ending on twelve. Verse eight. Judah said to Israel, his father, "Send the lad with me, and we will arise and go, and we may live and not die, both we and you, and also our little ones. I myself will be surety for him, Benjamin. From my hand, you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me." Bear the blame forever. That's the way a man with discernment thinks. That's the one who's thinking biblically with a biblical principle. Verse 10. For if we had not lingered, a little smart elekish here too is Judah. For if we had not lingered, surely by now we would have returned the second time. And their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the best fruits of the land in your vessels and carry down a present to the man. A little balm, a little honey, spices, myrrh, pistachio nuts, and almonds. Now, these gifts aren't just normal gifts. These are really, really, really good gifts. Okay? Think about it. You, you, you essentially have the land of milk and honey going down to get healing from the foreign Gentiles. You thought about that? This isn't the first time we've seen really similar gifts go down to Egypt, though. Remember when Joseph was sold into slavery? Guess what the Ishmaelite traders had with them? Go to Genesis 37. 37. And let's look at twenty-seven. Verse twenty seven in Genesis thirty seven. Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, and his brothers listen. The Midianite traders passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. This is in here somewhere. I know it is. Sorry. 25? Okay, 25. 
And they sat down to eat a meal. Then they lifted their eyes and looked, and there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing spices and balm and myrrh on their way down to carry them to Judah. Now, think about it this way. you got the covenant people of God, and throughout the Bible, this is really important because we always talk about Israel because they were the covenant people. Who's coming from Israel to restore all things? Jesus. But all throughout the Old Testament, God still loved the Gentiles. The Gentiles were going to be saved. But what's one way that God saved the Gentiles? Well, in this story, he sends Joseph down to Egypt, and they're all converted. Maybe not all of them, but you get the point. There's a conversion that happens. So now, isn't it funny that the covenant people of God, the brothers, are going to have to take these same gifts, and they're going to have to go be healed by the foreign pagans? That's a principle that God did. Remember in the New Testament when the Apostle Paul was talking in Romans 11, and he said, I want my brothers, the Jews, to be saved. But to provoke them to jealousy, the gospel has gone to the who? The Gentiles. So the Gentiles were being saved, and then the Jews would follow suit. Everybody see the pattern? That's the same. That happens all throughout the Bible. Genesis, uh, Deuteronomy 32 predicted that exactly. Okay, back to 43, and I'll finish this story and stop talking. It's so good, though. Okay, we're in verse um, 12. Take double money double blessing in your hand and take back in your hand the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks remember Joseph had all their money put back in there and when they saw it their hearts sank perhaps it was an oversight take your brother also and arise and go back to the man and may God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may release your brother other brother and Benjamin if I am bereaved I'm bereaved so the men took the present and Benjamin, and they took double money in their hand and arose and went down to Egypt, and they stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of the house, Take these men to my home and slaughter an animal and make ready, for these men will dine with me at noon. Then the man did as Joseph ordered, and the man brought the men into Joseph's house. Now the men were afraid... Because they were brought to Joseph's house. And they said, it is because of the money which was returned to our sacks the first time that we are brought in. So that he may make a case against us, seize us, and take us as slaves with our donkeys. Watch verse 19. When they drew near to the steward of Joseph's house, they talked with him where? At, at the, on the porch, more or less. Now watch this. They're going to start outside, and they're going to make their way inside. You know, this is kind of cool. Follow me. Verse 20. And said, O oh, sir, we indeed came down the first time to buy food. But it happened when we came to the encampment that we opened our sacks. And there each man's money was in the mouth of his sack. Our money in full weight. So we have brought it back in our hand. Scared, fearful. Wouldn't you be scared and fearful if you were in the same situation as them? Don't know what you're going to do. You're looking for answers here. This, for whatever reason... All the other people from all the other nations, they walk in and ask Joseph, can we get some food? And he just gives it to them. You walk in there and he starts interrogating you. Says he wants to see your brother. Calls you a spy. Verse 22. We have brought down other money in our hands to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. But he said, the, the servant, the steward, peace be with you. Do not be afraid. Your who? Your God, and the God of your fathers, reminds them of the covenant, has given you treasure in your sacks. You know what this means? You know what this steward, this household servant is? You know what he is? He's a believer. He's a believer. You've got these covenant people trusting God less than this, um, than this Gentile who's now a believer, trusting in the Lord. Then he brought Simeon out to them. So the man brought the men into Joseph's house, gave them water, and they washed their feet, and he gave their donkeys feed. And I want to make some great connection to the foot washing in the New Testament, but I'll just give you something simple. Possibly why they got their feet washed, remember Joseph had called them spies. Um, remember, like, people would go in and spy out land? Remember when Moses sent the 12 spies into Canaan to spy it out? That's what Joseph thought they were doing to him in Egypt. Or accused him. He knew better, but that's what he accused him of. 
So when they wash their feet, if you're a spy, you run around on your feet. Possibly that's why they wash his feet. I don't know. That's the best I got. Find somebody better than me to explain that one. 25. Then they made the present ready for Joseph's coming at noon. For they heard that they would eat bread there. I'm not going to go back there because I don't have time. But in Genesis 37, right before they sold Joseph into slavery, you know what it says they, they did? It goes out of their way to say they did this. They ate a meal. Food's really important in the Bible. And here they're going to eat bread and wine, commun- communion elements. Sound familiar? And when Joseph came home, they brought him the present, which was in their hand, into the house, and bowed down before him to the earth. Then he asked them about their well-being and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? And they answered, Your servant, our father, is in good health. He is still alive. And they bowed their heads down and prostrated themselves. Then he lifted his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your younger brother of whom you spoke to me? And he said, God be gracious to you, my son. Can you imagine what they thought whenever <laughs> they've, he's been scorning them both the times he's met them, and now he meets Benjamin and says, God be gracious to you, buddy. Glad to meet you. Remember, they're brothers, same mom. 30. Now his heart yearned for his brother. So Joseph made haste and sought somewhere to weep. You know, that's a, probably a biblical principle right there, too. Don't you have a desire to see the well-being of your brothers and sisters who are in Christ? I mean, specifically our family, but that should be the desire that we have for one another. And it's such disheartening, I think, to the outside world when they have to look at a church and say, people can't get along. They don't have love for one another. Remember what Jesus said, by this all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. That's got to be a characteristic of our church, guys. Got to be a characteristic of our church. It's non-negotiable. Do you think we'll have any impact on anybody outside the kingdom if we don't have a desire and a yearning for our own brothers and sisters? Tell them, Jerome. Tell them. Verse 30. So Joseph made haste and sought somewhere to weep, and he went into his chamber and wept there. Then he washed his face and came out, and he restrained himself and said, Serve the bread. Now, oh, I don't really want to do this. This I'm not going to do it. Never mind. Verse 32. So they set him a place by himself and by themselves, and the Egyptians who ate with them by themselves, because the Egyptians could not eat food with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination to the Egyptians. So Egyptians can't eat with Hebrews because they're lower or lesser. Remember, the most powerful people in all of the known world at this time are the who? The Egyptians. We can't eat with the Hebrews. We're not eating with them. But here's what's funny. Remember how in the Old Covenant, God always kept the Jews away from the Gentile pagans? And he said, you can't marry them. He didn't want them eating at the same table because they would eat the food offered to all these pagan gods. Remember in the New Testament, that was a big deal? Paul's like, look, it ain't sin, but if y'all can refrain from it, chill out now, okay? Well, the roles are reversed because now you've got the Egyptians who are the believers sitting at a different table than the brothers who are the covenant people who hadn't been trusting God. Do you ever look back at your life and say, God, thank you for the grace that you've shown me? Do we, do we ever do that? You ever mess something up and then you got another chance at it? Now you think about it. Every opportunity the brothers had with Joseph, they jacked it up. But God was gracious to them. He gave them another chance. There's repentance here. So when Benjamin comes along, they get a chance to hold true to their word. When they get sent out with Benjamin, he gets delivered to Egypt. They don't pull any kind of stunts. Exactly what they said was going to happen, happened. That's a, a true point that's pointing to Judah as well, being a ringleader of all of this. Judah is the one who was faithful and righteous in it and was blessed at Jacob's death because of it. 32. So they said, uh, 33, sorry. And they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the brothers looked in astonishment at one another. Don't you know they were thinking, what in the world is going on? What are we doing? Then he took servings to them from before Benjamin. But Benjamin's serving was five times as much as any of theirs. So they drank and were merry with him. I know you're Baptist, but they got drunk. That's what's happened probably in that sense. Bread and wine, we got a meal together. We've been reunited. The first time they ate together, they sold Joseph. Benjamin, another chance has come. 
and now they're eating together. We've got restoration. Think about these principles. Joseph, everything bad that happened to Joseph, I got time. Everything bad that happened to Joseph in his life. If I was Joseph, I'd have been so bitter. It wouldn't have been nothing to it. I'd have been so bitter. Joseph gets sold into slavery. His brothers hate his guts. He loved his dad. And he got separated from him. He goes to Potiphar's house, didn't do anything wrong. He goes to prison, all because of his stinking, dirty, rotten, no good brothers. The, the Jews, his own people, and the Egyptians treat him like royalty. He sits at the right hand of Pharaoh. Remember last chapter in Genesis chapter 42? Remember what happened when Joseph had those kids at the end of Genesis 42? What did he name them? Does anybody remember? Ephraim and Manasseh. Hebrew names or Egyptian names? You know what Ephraim means? I let it go. I forgot. I let it go. You know what Manasseh means? The Lord has blessed me in my affliction. See, Joseph had come to a place where he was at peace. Can you imagine the Egyptians walking around? Remember, Joseph got his name changed. Zaphnath, Paneah, something really weird. And uh, can you imagine the Egyptians coming around? They're like, what would you name your kids Hebrew names for? Because no matter where he was, this principle was true for Joseph's life. He valued the covenant and his relationship with God and the promises God had made to him more than anything else that was in his life. Once Joseph comes to peace with that, then in Genesis chapter 43, after he's at peace with God, now God begins to restore his brothers and the rest of his family to him. And that's a biblical principle for you. So if you're seeking restoration with some folks, I would challenge you to seek peace with God and then pray that God would bring restoration to your brothers. You think about it. We've been given the ministry of reconciliation. We reconcile men to God, but since we've been reconciled to God, can we not reconcile ourselves to one another and live especially among the community of faith? So, y'all enjoy this story? It's a really good story. Me too. Any questions? All right, clear as mud. Let's pray. <laughs>